um, been able to provide this service for us, and so we want to welcome all of our virtual viewers as well. My name is Jimmy Phillips. I'm the Executive Director of Marketing and Communications here at San Joaquin Community Hospital. And so thank you so much for those of you who are new today and those of you who are return, to returning guests for one of our lecture series events. Uh, today we have a very special program for you. Most of our events so far this year have focused on things like heart disease, stroke, healthy eating, joint pain, and other types of chronic pain that people experience. We're shifting gears to something that is that is a very seasonal um, type of thing, but certainly very important here where we live in Bakersfield and Kern County. One of the sunniest places in the United States, right? And there are lots of really crazy statistics about when you get sunburned, when you get certain sun exposure, your risk for melanoma and other forms of skin cancer just increases exponentially. So like we do with all of our lecture events, our goal here is first and foremost to help give you strategies to prevent from getting skin cancer in the first place, because that's the ultimate goal. But secondly, if you've been exposed to a lot of sun, we want to help you be able to recognize the indicators of skin cancer and other skin um, diseases very early on, because like any form of cancer, it's so much easier to treat and the outcomes are so much better the earlier we're able to catch it. And that starts with you guys. Just as a special preview as well, most of you have probably heard by now, but tomorrow we're doing a free skin cancer screening at the AIS Cancer Center across the street. And so if you're interested in signing up for that, it's completely free. We'll be raffling off spray tan. It was kind of a little fun promotion. <laughs> Still got to get tan, right? There's other ways to go about doing it. Um, you're welcome to sign up for that. Just check back in um, in the lobby and let them know that you want to sign up for the skin screening tomorrow. That's 4 to 7 at the AIS Cancer Center. Or you can call us at the same number that you RSVP'd for the lecture at. So that is another option that we're trying to provide you, a very tangible way to understand if you have any of the symptoms of skin cancer right now. Today we have two special presenters for you, so two is always better than one. The AIS Cancer <laughs> Center is Bakersfield's most comprehensive cancer center. Of course, it's operated and run by San Joaquin Community Hospital, which means you get the integration between the hospital-based care, wonderful surgeons that we work with, and our oncologist at the AIS Cancer Center. And so we have two oncologists that will present today. First and foremost, we have Dr. Luis Mariscal, and he will be followed by Dr. Constance Constant stare. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mariscal. Okay, so everyone can hear me okay at that level? Okay. Thanks so much for taking time out of your day to join us for this, and hopefully this will be educational and, and helpful for you. So. Uh, we're going to go through some slides together, and then there'll be plenty of time after for any questions that you have. So, uh, so like Jimmy said, I'm a radiation oncologist at the AIS Cancer Center. So uh, I do see a good number of skin cancers of all kinds at all different stages. So, uh, so we'll get started. So basically, what is skin cancer? So and how common is it? So skin cancer is any cancer that develops on the surface of your body, the skin. You have skin covering all of the exterior surface of your body, and there's several types of cancer that can arise from the skin. Uh, you've probably heard of melanoma. That's one type of skin cancer, and that can be a very uh, dangerous type of skin cancer to have. But there are several other types of skin cancer, most commonly, squamous cell carcinoma and also basal cell carcinoma. And when you look at all of those types of skin cancer, it's actually the most common cancer in the United States. So by far, uh, there's over 5 million new cases of skin cancer every year diagnosed in this country. Now fortunately, most of them are very early stage, not very advanced as far as aggressiveness either. But some of them are very aggressive. Some of them are melanomas, which in general are very aggressive. So, um, and unfortunately, skin cancer of all kinds has been increasing. And there's various reasons for that. We'll talk about some of those reasons. So, uh, so these are, this is a diagram just showing you what the skin is like and the different layers of the skin. 
And basically, these cancers can arise from various layers of the skin. The squamous layer is the topmost layer of your skin. It's what you see on the surface. And just below that, there's the basal layer. And below that, there's the melanocytes. And those are cells that give you pigment. So the color on your skin is created by those cells. And those are the cells that develop into melanoma when things go awry. Uh, and below that, you have several other layers, including the sweat gland layers and deeper layers. Uh, so, like we said, you can have cancers that develop out of many of these different types of cells. Melanomas come out of those melanocytes, and then basal cells and squamous cell cancers come out of those respective layers. Doesn't work. So let's talk about melanoma. Um, so melanoma is generally one of the cancers that can, in a sense, be easier to, to diagnose. A lot of times you have a a mole or a spot that you see on your skin, and it will typically be dark. Uh, it may look black or brown or even blue. Sometimes they may bleed, uh, and over time they tend to get bigger. Uh, so anything that looks like that is something that you want to definitely have your, your physician take a look at. They can develop on any part of your skin. They do commonly develop on sun-exposed skin, so areas that get a lot of sun, your back, your chest, arms, legs, but they can also develop in, in places that may not get a whole lot of sun exposure. In some cases, they can even come on the palms of your hands or the bottom of your feet or even under your nails, so those are, even though you don't think of those as places that get a lot of sun, you could still have a, a melanoma developed in those spaces. But generally, it's going to be on the areas of, of your body that get a lot of sun. And fortunately, this is a not very common type of skin cancer. So I said earlier, there are about 5 million new cases of skin cancer. There's only about 80,000 new cases of melanoma every year. But in general, those are much more difficult to, to treat and to cure. So even though they're not as common, they are very significant when you do develop one of these. You can usually cure it though when you catch it early, so that's the important why it's important to be screened for these regularly. Uh, it's much easier to, to cure it if you find it early. And you know fortunately most of the cancers that you get on your skin are not known. Usually it's basal cell or squamous cell. Uh, so squamous cell is very common uh, and usually they will look like an area on your skin that's kind of scaly or red or pinkish. And again, over time, they might start getting bigger. But generally, they're, they're not a dark type of lesion like a melanoma. Uh, and they are also somewhat aggressive. They can definitely spread from the site in your body that they start. But they're generally not as aggressive as a, a melanoma like skin cancer. So, what are the causes of skin cancer? So the most important cause of skin cancer is exposure to UV radiation. So we get UV radiation going outside. So the sun provides you with UV radiation. And when you get a little bit of sun, that's actually good for you. But when you're out in the sun a lot without any protection, that can lead eventually to developing a skin cancer. There are some other ways that we get UV radiation, we'll talk about those, but that's the common way. And the UV radiation in small amounts is actually good for you. It's necessary for the natural function of your body, but when you get too much, it can cause damage to something called DNA. And DNA is just the, the instructions for all the cells in your body. And if they get damaged, things can go out of the normal way of function and then develop into a cancer. Uh, so the main risk factor, like we said, is UV radiation. But if you have an area that's always irritated, that is constantly you know, irritated and becoming new skin, or a wound, or a scar, if you had a burn previously, those are also areas that you can develop a skin cancer that's not related to sun exposure or UV. Radiation. So that's another another thing that you want to keep an eye on if you have any kind of 
chronic area that's always irritated. Um, and many of us, almost everyone has moles on their skin, some that you might have been born with, some that have popped up over, over your life. And those are things that you want to keep an eye on. You want to always see, is there any change in the mole? A mole in, in and of itself is not a problem. But if it's changing, if it starts to suddenly get bigger, change color, uh, start to look kind of jagged instead of having nice borders around it, nice even round borders, that's something that is concerning and you definitely want to have, have it looked at. Uh, so, so we talked a little bit about sun exposure and sun exposure at any time can be can be dangerous if it's too much, but definitely when you're young, the sun exposure that you get as a child and as a young adult can definitely, you know, if you got overexposed, if you had multiple sunburns as a child or as a young adult, those can lead in the future to an increased risk of, of developing a skin cancer of any kind. Uh, so that's why it's important, even as a kid or if you have children, that you want to definitely teach them good sun habits and, and to use sunscreen and, and avoid the highest and hottest sun of the day. Uh, and when you do have a sunburn, that does, just even one sunburn does increase your risk of developing skin cancer. And multiple sunburns over the course of a lifetime definitely dramatically increase the risk of developing uh, a skin cancer. Um, and unfortunately, almost everyone at some point of their childhood or early life has a sunburn at least one. So it is very important to be aware of, of the risk. There are other things that we do that can uh, be risky. And definitely tanning beds are a big concern, uh, especially in some parts of the country that don't get a lot of sun. But even in California, people often frequent tanning beds. And, and that's concentrated UV radiation. And it is very dangerous. It is actually more dangerous than even being out in the normal sun uh, because of the amount of radiation that you get in a small period of time. And so there is definitely a lot of evidence that frequent use of a tanning bed definitely dramatically increases your risk of developing skin cancer. So that's one very big risk. Obviously lying out by the pool in the sun is also going to give you a lot of sun exposure and increase your risk, so that is still definitely important. Uh, but like I said, a little bit of sun with adequate protection and, and smart sun safety habits is actually good for you. You just have to be wise about how you're getting your sun exposure and limit it uh, to a healthy amount. The other is, it, you know, when you have a lot of sun exposure, it also creates premature aging of your skin. So wrinkling and drying of your skin. So that's another reason, not cancer related, to try and avoid overexposure to the sun and UV rays. So, so we have a short video and Dr. Stella will introduce that to us. I'm Dr. Stare, I'm one of the medical oncologists at the AIS Cancer Center. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so the, the next um, thing that we're going to show you is actually a video. Um, this is a video that was put together by the David Cornfield Melanoma Fund, and it's actually a, um, a Canadian organization that's dedicated to preventing melanoma by increasing awareness about this potentially deadly disease. And I thought it was really um, a powerful message and I wanted to share this with you today. Dear 16-year-old me. Dear 16-year-old me. Dear 16-year-old me. Please don't get that perv. It's not as awesome as you think it's gonna be. You have to actually practice in order to learn to play guitar. Whiskey? Tastes even worse on the way up. Dear 16-year-old me, there's going to be a new set of Star Wars movies. Don't watch them. They ruin everything. <laughs> Dear 16-year-old me, this is where they took the cancer out.
It was something called melanoma. It's called malignant melanoma. Malignant melanoma. Malignant. That's not a very friendly word. You'll be diagnosed when you're 28. 18. 36. 29. 22. It's a tumor that starts in your skin cells, the cells that give your hair and skin color. It's not just skin cancer. Well, it is. Well, it is. But not just the cut it out and it'll be fine kind, unfortunately. It's the kind that you have to catch before it spreads. Because it spreads so fast. So fast. To places like your liver, your lungs, your brain. Yours will be a really rare kind in your left eye. And that's when you'll find out. That melanoma can show up on your tongue, the palms of your hands, and the soles of your feet. Your doctors will tell you you're lucky that you caught it early. Yours will tell you that you need aggressive treatment. I'll have to tell you it might take a year of chemotherapy. And you'll need to do some of the injections yourself. Dear 16-year-old me. You're doing okay. You're strong. But there are some things I want you to know. I wish I'd known. That one bad sunburn before you turn 18 doubles your chances of developing melanoma. That fair skin and red hair means that you're at a higher risk of getting it. As if ginger people didn't have enough problems. That you're at higher risk if you've got more than 50 moles. And if you have a weakened immune system or a family history of skin cancer. I want you to know the outlook is very good if we can catch it early. But you have less than a 10% chance of surviving more than five years if we don't. Dear 16 year old me, Spend more time with family, they mean everything. If I had one piece of advice for you, don't start the tanning bed. I know you want a healthy glow, but it's going to double my chances of getting melanoma. Sunscreen. Yes, I agree. It's a huge pain in the ass, but so worth it. Please. Your skin's like an elephant. It never forgets. Dear 16-year-old me, helping spread this message is how you'll honor Glenna's memory. At 16, she's already an incredible lifeguard. She loves the sun and the beach, and tanning, but she just doesn't know. She'll be diagnosed when she's 22, and will lose her battle when she's just 26. I want you to know, because it's melanoma that's going to take the strongest man you know, your best friend, and the love of your life. Dear 16-year-old me, Don't be afraid. This isn't about being afraid. I want you to be aware that melanoma is a young person's disease. It is the second most common cancer in children and teenagers, and one of the most common in young adults. And it can be deadly. I want you to know you're not helpless. This is a cancer that shows itself right there on the outside of you. Start checking your skin. Please check. Get to know your skin. Get to know your skin. Start checking your skin. If a new mole shows up, or if when you have, starts to change color, or size, or shape, or feels different. If something seems out of place, get your doctor to have a look as soon as possible. Know what to look for, and get help. These are all signs your skin could be developing cancer. You brush your teeth every day, maybe even floss. Okay, we both know you don't floss. But just once a month, I want you to check. It takes 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Dear 16 year old me, I do realize you're not actually going to see this, but someone else will, and it'll make a difference to them. Dear someone else. Dear somebody else. If you're watching this, send it to a 16 year old you care about. Send it to anyone who is once 16. Or soon will be 16. Send this. And check yourself. Educate yourself. You can download tools and information about melanoma here. Share this link. Tweet this link. Post this to your Facebook.
So, as you can see from that video, prevention really is key, and the earlier you start, the better. Um, so, you know, the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to prepare every time you're going to go out into the sun, um, especially when the sun's rays are the strongest, which is usually between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, and even if you don't plan on being out long, all those minutes of sun exposure add up. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so UV radiation can pass through the clouds. So even on a cloudy day like today, uh, you will be at risk for the damage that can be um, caused by UV radiation. Um, so generally, you want to seek shade under trees, umbrellas, a structure like a porch. Um, or a tent, those provide protection against the sun. And of course, sunscreen is also recommended. Um, even if you're sitting in the shade, because UV rays can bounce off of reflective surfaces like cement or sand if you're at the beach. So sunscreen um, comes in a wide variety of forms. They're sun blocking agents um, that protect your skin from sun damage and mostly sunburn. Um, they come in gels, lotions, sprays, and when you see on the side of the bottle it says SPF, that stands for sun, protected, sun protection factor. Um, the higher the number, the more protection. And you want to look for a sunscreen that, that prevents um, UVA and UVB uh, radiation. Um, so generally you want to use an SPF of at least 30 or greater um, and use it on areas that are going to be exposed to the sun. So if you're wearing clothes, you don't need to wear under there. Um, if you are fair-skinned, you generally want to use an SPF that's higher. Um, or if you plan on being out in intense sunlight, then, you know, like around noon when the sun is at its peak, then you should probably use a higher SPF. All right. So um, this next slide, flip, slop, slap, and wrap. That's a motto that I think comes from an Australian campaign for um, preventing sunburn and UV exposure. And what it really means is slip on a shirt, slop on some sunscreen, slap on a hat, um, and wrap on some sunglasses to protect your eyes. So generally, you want to apply your sunscreen about 15 to 30 minutes before you plan on going outside. Um, and on average, you want to use around two tablespoons. Um, that covers an adult adults' arms, legs, um, neck, and face. You'll need more if you're going to cover your chest or your back. Um, and if you don't use enough, then you're probably not getting an adequate amount of protection from that sunscreen. So how much and how often is another question that we encounter. So if you are going to go out swimming, then you want to reapply your sunblock or your sunscreen um, after you come out and dry off anything where you're rubbing your face, then it's going to wipe off the lotion, so you want to reapply. Um, if you don't plan on going out and getting, you know, go, getting wet, going swimming, um, or if you're not sweating a lot, you still want to reapply your sunscreen about every um, two to three hours that you're out in the sun. Um, and also remember that your lips need protection too. So you want to use some kind of um, like lip balm that has a sun blocking agent in it. Again, SPF 30 and above. And also reapply it frequently. How high does it go? How high can it go? I think I've seen up to 50. And so I've even seen like 55. <coughs> yeah. So they, they go up pretty high, but the really important thing is to reapply it. So just because you're using an SPF of 50 doesn't mean that you can wear it for longer. You still need to reapply. Um, and another question we get is, does sunscreen expire? Because you probably have a lot of sunscreen from all the times that you go to the beach. You know, what do you do with those? So most of your sunscreen bottles, just like food, they have expiration dates somewhere on it. It'll be on the box, it'll be on the tube, it'll be on the bottle. You just have to look out for it. Um, and so if you don't find it, maybe it was on the box, it's not on the bottle, or maybe it rubbed off, then ge the general rule is that it'll last for about three years. But that lifetime or that SPS factor will be reduced if you're storing it in a hot area. So if you keep it in your car, then it may not 
have um, as much of a protective effect as you think it does. So just store it correctly. Um, and clothing, it also counts as sun protection too. So you, you know, in addition to your sunscreen, make sure that you're covering up any other parts of you. So um, it, it, as you can see, this woman, she's wearing a wide brimmed hat to protect her face. She's wearing long sleeve, um, like a sweater, and she's wearing pants. And those generally will protect you from the sun. The tighter the weave, so if it's like a canvas, it's more protective than something that's a looser knit, like linen. Um, and also darker colors, like she's wearing black pants, that will be more protective than a lighter fabric. Um, also sunglasses, which she's not wearing, but sunglasses, if they have 100% um, UV protection, that protects your eyes from developing cataracts, because that's the effect of UV radiation. Um, but it also protects the very sensitive skin that's around your eyes, um, which you may not always put lotion on. So we talked about the dangers of um, tanning booths and going out in the sun for a tan, but what about sunless tanning? So this tends to be um, a, a safer way of achieving that glow that you want. Um, how they work is that they come in different forms, lotions, gels, sprays. Um, all they do is they stain the top surface of the skin, making it darker, but it only lasts probably for about a week unless you reapply it. Um, and just remember that just because you look tan doesn't mean that that tan is protecting you from the sun. So you still need to apply all of your sunscreen, wear your sunglasses, wear your wide brim pad. Just protect yourself. So, so early detection again, um, and they talked about this in the video, and Dr. Mariscal talked about it as well. But you want to set aside time to look at your skin. So just know what your body looks like, know what is normal for you, and that way if anything comes up that is new, um, you'll be able to detect it earlier and bring it to the attention of your doctor. So you know, everyone has moles or freckles, so just get used to knowing what those look like. The things that should alert you to um, something that you need to bring to the attention of your doctor will be something that's a new growth. Um, if it's a spot, a bump, or a mole that has slowly <coughs> changed, in some way changes in color, got changes in size, um, those are things that you need to be aware of that shouldn't be happening. Moles, usually they stay the same size, they don't change over time. Um, another thing to um, be aware of is if you have like a sore that doesn't go away. Um, that, that can also be a sign of cancer because as Dr. Mariscal pointed out, not all melanoma or not all skin cancer will be pigmented. It can actually just look like regular skin, but you should be healing. So if you have an ulcer that's not healing, then you need to bring that to the attention of your doctor. So the ABCD rule, um, this is just, the, again, the general thing to remember. So if you have a mole that's asymmetric, so it's, it's not one that you could fold it in half and it looks the same on all sides, um, that's probably something that should be checked out. If the, the border is irregular, and that kind of goes to symmetry. So if it has an irregular border, it's not a smooth, round border, then that's also something that um, you just need to watch. Um, color, you know, if the, if the mole isn't a uniform color, if it has some darker areas, if it has a black area and like a lighter colored area, again, these are all things that you should be aware of and bring to attention of your physician. Um, the diameter, when it gets to be the size that's bigger than um, like the head of an eraser on a pencil, then that's also a size that we get concerned about and generally want to biopsy. Um, the ABCD rule, I think more recently, was also changed to the ABCDE rule, and the E is evolution. And it's, again, if the, the mole is changing in size, if it's one that you've always had, but then recently it got bigger, it changes in color, it you know looks like it's injured and it won't heal, then those, again, are things that you should bring to our attention. And this is an example of melanoma. So the top, you see there's a normal mole. 
Um, a normal mold that's round, the edges are smooth. If you fold it in half, it's symmetric. Um, that's something that we wouldn't be too concerned about um, if you brought it to our attention. But the melanoma, you see that it doesn't look, you can't fold it in half, it's not even on both sides. It has areas that are different um, in color, and texture. So those are the things that you, know, you should probably have biopsy. All right, so, but pretty much, I mean, as scary as all this is, uh, melanoma is fairly rare, but it's just that when we do detect it, we want to treat it as aggressively as we can. So, um, thank you so much for your time. And I think we're going to do questions, question and answer. So we'll open it up for any questions that you have, and you can direct it to one of us or just in general for both of us, however you want to direct it. Okay. If both your parents had melanoma, um, and your aunt's knew how to inherit it, if both your parents had melanoma and aunts, Okay, so, um, so you're asking about if you have a family history of melanoma, what are your risk factors? Yeah. Okay, so um, it still goes, to, there's many risk factors. Uh, we don't really have a genetic, like, passed on to families that we're, we're aware of. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> but you, you, you look like you're fair skin. I mean, you can't see her. But you're, you're fair skin, you have fair hair, you're just in general going to be at higher risk than someone who has darker skin, um, darker complexion. That's, so I think that's your main risk factor is going to be that. So, and your parents, how old are they? In their, in their youth, they probably didn't have sunblock. They probably were out in the sun more without protection. Baby oil. Yeah, baby oil. <laughs> Okay, so that is not a protective factor. <laughs> um, you, and, and that's why we're talking about sunblock and sunscreen because that really wasn't something that people were aware of until very recently, like in the past 20, 30 years. Um, so, so I think that that's probably, when we're looking at risk factors, we're looking at your complexion um, mostly and then the risk factors like sun exposure. There, there, there. Uh, lately, in fact, it was just this year, I noticed they have the new spray, and they say, you know, there's certain kinds of that you can breathe and still protect you. Is there a form of the gel or spray that would be better than the other? Do you know? So, I'll take this. So, basically, is there a, one type of sunscreen that's better than a different type of sunscreen? So, you know, a lot of you can get creams, you can get sprays, gels, and really, as long as they have a good SPF factor, uh, you know, it's really going to depend on how you like the feel on your skin. Uh, also, some of them will last longer when you're sweating, uh, when you're in the water. So, depending on what exposure to the sun you're going to have, how long you're going to have between times that you can reapply it, you know, I would judge based on that. But as far as, as long as it has a good SPF factor, they're all going to be very comparable in protection, but some may just not stay on your skin as well if you're active or in the water. At one time there was an idea that you could have 70, but it's not any better than like there was a certain cap that really was, so is that not true any longer? So actually, I was just reading a couple days ago, there's a push to kind of look at the different SPF ratings because it's kind of like grade inflation. Uh, well, this is 90, this is 100. There's probably a cutoff where it really doesn't help anymore, and that probably is about 50. And so I think there's, in the next couple of years, going to be a, a real look at the SPF ratings and trying to standardize it instead of basing it on what the, the maker of the sunscreen says but really testing each sunscreen and seeing 
is it providing the protection that they're saying it's providing? Uh, so I think that's going to change a little bit. I think we had a fact there, and then we had a fact there. Does Melanoma always have irregular borders and areas of color? No, um, because melanoma can also be non pigmented, so it can look just like the rest of your skin, but it can be a little bump that you didn't have before. Um, so that's why, you know, anything that looks irregular or out of the norm for you, then you should bring it to the attention of your doctor. Biopsies are very easy to do in the office. Just to add to that, so even though we showed you a picture of a couple different melanomas and they were dark, they could instead look like a red bump. There's even melanomas that are white. They're very rare, but, you know, anything that is new or changing, like Dr. Stair said, any evolution, of a, of a bump on your skin or a lesion on your skin, you want to have it checked out and at least followed over time to make sure it's not changing dramatically. I wanted to ask about the protective clothing that's on the market. Like, is it Sure. Um, so yeah, there are different uh, clothing kind of meant for sun protection. Every clothing you wear has some protective factor. So even though these are specialized clothing made to protect you in the sun, you know, any clothing you're wearing is protecting your skin to some extent. But some of these have more protection and, uh, you know, again, right now there's not a great standardization of what protection you're actually getting based on what they're advertising. So, you know, you have to kind of take it cautiously. But any clothing you wear is going to provide some protection. Uh, so, generally, if it's a good, thick piece of clothing, you're not going to have significant UV penetration of that. And you probably don't need to put sunscreen under closed skin in general. Essentially, you know, we're going to examine, examine you, take a look at all of the surfaces of your skin because you could develop a skin cancer in any area of skin. And then if there is something that's suspicious, then we'll you know, arrange for the next step of further evaluation of those regions. Yeah. Um, so I've seen that. I think I think Neutrogena maybe has that as, as their, you know, it's it's kind of a trade name of their specific formulation. Uh, so again, it's really going to come down to personal preference on how it feels on your skin, how it's going to last based on the activity that you're you're doing. And I think, like I said, things are going to change probably in the next few years because there is concern that there's a lot of confusion. When you go to the sunscreen aisle, there's hundreds of different sunscreens with different numbers. And are they really giving you the protection that you think you're getting? So I think there's going to be a change in, in how manufacturers can advertise that protection. 
But until then, you want to have something SPF 50 or above from a, a relatively you know, well-known brand. That's, that's what I would recommend. So those are the most common types. Um, most of the time they come up as little, like if it's, uh, if it's a squamous cell, it might be like a little flaky patch that is easy to ignore. Um, and the basal cell tends to be like a pearly papule, usually on the face. Um, if you leave it alone, then there is a chance that it can get bigger. It can actually spread. Um, it's less likely to do that or less it's not as aggressive as malignant melanoma. It tends, that tends to spread much faster, even small lesions. But um, squamous cell and squamous cell do have the capability of spreading systemically, so it can go elsewhere in the body. So the general recommendation is yes, you should, because you're walking to the car, to the, the supermarket, you're gonna walk back, you're gonna walk to your house. So it's all those minutes that add up over time. And so that's why you just wanna protect yourself as much as you can. There is no safe period. <laughs> I guess at night. <laughs> What about the freezing technique that a lot of the dermatologists do? Is that preventive or is it more just cosmetic? Um, so are, you're talking about for like the little squamous cell? Yeah. yeah. I've had the squamous and I've had the basal cell, but she always wants to freeze yeah. everything else off. So <laughs> what, she's, what she's freezing off is probably something called actinic keratosis, which is like a pre-cancer for squamous cell. And so that's the treatment is, you know, rather than cut it out, they, they can cut it out if it's really big, um, but freezing it off will prevent it because it, you know, usually it'll freeze off, dry up, and dry up and fall off, right? So so that's that's the treatment. You are actually getting treated for that. But it will really come back. It can come back, but the but really what you're seeing, because you're probably getting sprayed in the same places or what seems to you like the same places over and over again, it's because those are areas that were that had sun exposure, and so the sun damage is there, but it just they don't it doesn't all come out at the same time. Yeah. Since you mentioned acting here, this is one year I was examined, I had sixteen of them you know. And then the next year I had none and the dermatologist said, Well they could just disappear, you know, without being treated. That was Um, so yeah, you know, what we're talking about, the actinic keratosis, so it is a, an area that can become cancer. It won't necessarily. And it can actually resolve on its own, sometimes they do. It's definitely something that you want to have followed over time because some percent of them will eventually become an actual squamous cell carcinoma, which then has the potential to spread. So, but definitely sometimes they can be there and over time just resolve, or sometimes your dermatologist might give you a cream to put on it, which will help get rid of it, or like we were talking about using cryotherapy, that's the reasoning, you can do that. So, uh, you know, it's not impossible for them to resolve even on their own, but they have to be watched. Thank you. Um, 
You definitely can. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've treated several in the last month. Um, so definitely anywhere, technically anywhere on your skin, but definitely any sun-exposed skin, which your legs and your arms can definitely get regular sun exposure. Um, it's fine. You can wear whatever you're wearing. Um, if, if there is something that looks like it needs to be biopsied, they can always clean that area. keratosis are. They usually show up on places where you have a lot of friction. So it'll be around the collars for men. Um, it can also be on the back. That tends to be the most common place. Um, but they're benign. And again, if you ever have any doubt or any question in mind, you just show it to your doctor and they can tell you what it is or if they feel that they need to biopsy it, they can also do that. pigmented um, and, and they tend to appear solely over time but they're they're not like moles that evolve um, it's just a pigmentation that you may just notice over time but that's not not like a melanoma or a mole that's changing Everybody enjoy that? Yes. One more round of applause for Dr. Harris Collins. Thank you. A reminder, our free sunscreening tomorrow at the AIS Cancer Center. Check in in the lobby if you haven't already signed up. You can sign up at RSVP. Um, and it's from 4 to 7 tomorrow. Again, you can call us as well this afternoon if you're you know, not sure you want to sign up right in the lobby. But you know, this is the education part of it. And I hope that so many of you are armed with tools and tactics to prevent and recognize um, skin cancer. I didn't realize there was really no safe amount of sun. So that was that was news to me in a sense. I'm gonna, you know, when I'm going into Costco now, I'm gonna have my spray it's gonna go on. So or maybe you just wear a suit all the time and spray my face. Yes, ma'am. Right across the street. So it's just on the other side of Yeah, so our hospital's right behind us there. The AIS Cancer Center is just on the other side of Chester Avenue. So right here on this same campus. Yep, yep, there's parking right in front of it, valet parking, so really easy access. You don't have to worry about the parking thing at all. So um, come early, come in the middle, come late. We invite you to come out tomorrow because obviously it's something that in the end it can save your life. We don't have our next lecture yet, but we'll, we'll be letting you know soon about our July topic. So on behalf of all of us here at San Joaquin Community Hospital and the AIS Cancer Center, thank you so much for coming today. Have a wonderful day.